Hello, I'm Mark Anderson from Michener Library, University of Northern Colorado, and this is the second part of the OER What's In It For Me session in the Michener Research Series. We'll be discussing the OER movement, where it came from, what conditions inspired it, where it is today, and perhaps more important questions, how can you find available OER and use them in your classes, and how can you contribute your own research to the expanding corpus of OER available on the internet. The two points of departure for this lesson are two Michener research guides, OER workshop, government resources, and education, open educational resources. Incidentally, if you're using the PowerPoint version of this presentation, every web page is hyperlinked to the website it represents. Use the mouse roller to advance the slides and the cursor to go live on the internet. OER, as we learned in the first video, are education-related resources that are created by teachers and scholars and made available on the internet. Uh, free of charge for others to use, share, or adapt for educational purposes. OER can be course materials such as textbooks or videos. They can be full courses that include syllabi, lesson plans, tests and assignments, or any other tools, materials, or techniques that support access to knowledge. At this time, OER are becoming increasingly available for all levels of education from K-12 through college and university. There are OER designed for adult education classes and for self-directed learning. Some colleges have developed complete programs for which a student can complete all the requirements for a degree without spending a penny on textbooks. The grandparent of the OER movement is the federal government's depository library system. FDLP, managed for the last 150 years by the government publishing office, is founded on the principle that an educated citizenry is vital to democracy. Information resources about government activities created at taxpayer expense ought to be available at the local level for citizens to use free of copyright or other restrictions. Thus, open education is conceptually linked to the patriotic ideals of free and open government and the maintenance of democratic institutions. <clears throat> For over 200 years, the government has been distributing publications to designated repositories. All, at first, the deposits consisted of legislative or judicial publications, like the congressional record and the decisions of the courts, the laws and statutes, and the regulations. <clears throat> but as the role of the executive branch expanded, library deposits included the kind of research-based publications that informed the regulatory processes. Agencies began to recognize their role in public education, marketing their programs to children who would grow up to be taxpayers and voters, and teachers was a good way to inspire lifelong interest in the agency, in its area of jurisdiction, and a lifelong appreciation of the role of government as a beneficial force in their, their lives. In the 1940s, the government agencies began publishing textbooks and readers, and complete lesson plans with assignments, activities, and tests that could be incorporated into elementary through high school curricula. These material were available to teachers and school districts free or at very low cost. These bilingual readers are some early examples. They were created in the 40s by the Education Division of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and were intended for use in the elementary reading programs in the reservation schools. They were designed to teach not only the native language but to communicate important aspects of traditional culture to reservation students who may have been denied the opportunity to learn those things in the Eurocentric schools they had attended before. They promote positive images of Native American men and women, the work that they did, their culture and lifestyle. In the 1950s, with the Sputnik and the space race, and the renewed emphasis on math and science teaching in public schools, 
NASA was probably the most prolific, prolific producer of free and low-cost curricular materials. NASA publications focus not only on astrophysics and other aerospace sciences, but also included more philosophical reflections on why human beings feel the need to explore the universe. NASA was the most prolific, but other agencies got into the act as well, including the Smithsonian, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, even the IRS. Incidentally, all of the publications featured in this part of the video are available in the government documents section um, in Michener Library. With the advent of the Internet, agencies were able to expand access to their print publications through the digital technologies, but more important, they were able to expand the range of formats available to teachers and students. Now these could include streaming video, DVD, computer software, and all kinds of games, puzzles, and toys that educate at the same time they amuse children. One of the earliest is Ben's Guide, produced by the government publishing office, which offers instructions on the structure and processes of the federal government. As you can see, it's divided into age and grade appropriate modules. NASA continues to crank out classroom materials for the sciences, but it's also the leader in producing online games, cartoons, toys, and puzzles. This module on birds, trees, and wildflowers was created by the National Forest Service. The Library of Congress and the National Archives have created modules for teaching history with primary resources. The CIA and the FBI have created modules that teach the history of their particular institutions but also modules designed to teach transferable skills such as problem solving and evidence evaluation. The CIA World Factbook with its colorful maps um, continues to be available for, instru for geography instruction at, at all levels. The U.S. Geological Survey has created modules in the um, earth sciences and life sciences appropriate for all levels of education from kindergarten through undergraduate. Various national parks have partnered with local school districts to incorporate field trips conducted by park rangers into the curriculum. The park provides maps, lessons, assignments, and suggested activities. <coughs> There is no centralized indexing or one-stop shopping for discovering all these materials. The FDLP's catalog of government publications provides a centralized discovery tool for many of these resources published since 1976, but it's weak on the non-print and non-PDF materials. To clearly see the range of resources available, one must either visit each agency's website individually or consult a librarian who specializes in government information. I'll mention briefly another contribution of the government to open education, and that's the open data policy. For over 200 years, government agencies have distributed surveys and conducted other kinds of data collection activities. Before the Internet, the data was uh, produced published as tables printed in publications like the Statistical Abstract of the United States and the Digest of Education Statistics. However, the development of machine-readable data formats made all of this more data more portable and more adaptable. Um, in 2013, the open data policy established by a presidential executive order 
mandated that agencies that collect data must make it available free to other users. They must catalog it and post it um, either on their own websites or in an open repository like data.gov. Most agencies had already been doing this. Um, data.gov first appeared about 10 years ago and has evolved into not only a repository for government raw data sets, but also a repository for projects by non-federal government researchers who use government data. Here's the metadata for the 2012 Academic Library Survey. Notice it's available in Excel, Microsoft Access, SPSS, and SAS. Furthermore, the Excel file has FIPS code, so it can be used in GIS mapping applications. Notice also the link to the publishing agency's landing page and the uh, display of the Creative Commons code. I'll return to Creative Commons later. In recent decades, interest in OER has expanded beyond the government, especially in um, higher education. One of the forces driving this movement is the increasing price of textbooks from commercial vendors. Since 1970, the average cost of college textbooks has increased 1,500%, three times the rate of inflation for all other consumer goods and services. But with the development of the Internet, it's become possible for anyone with a computer and Internet discoverable storage space to be author, publisher, and cataloger for one's own research. Academic authors don't have to depend on the for-profit systems of peer review and distribution. Many academic institutions are developing digital repositories like our own Digital UNC, maintained by the University Archives. Digital UNC is a repository for the use of UNC faculty and students who wish to make their research and research data openly accessible. Looking for solutions to the dramatic increase in student costs, higher education institutions have formed partnerships and coalitions to share resources. The earliest initiatives came out of the community colleges, such as this one, the, the Community College Consortium, Consortium for Open Educational Resources, the CCC OER was organized in 2007 by Dr. Martha Kentner at Foothill De Anza Community College as part of the Global Open Education Consortium. CCOER sponsors free webinars and conferences to educate faculty and students in the discovery and adaptation of OER. It includes a list of zero textbook degrees offered by its members, such as this one offered by Northern Virginia Community College. It includes instructions on Creative Commons open licensing protocols, which I'll return to later. But first, I want to refer you back to the OER Research Guide. You'll find links to many other coalitions and partnerships, and also links to many OER collections that are already available for you to use. Such as this one the open textbook library maintained by the University of Minnesota. The open textbook library includes hundreds of textbooks covering all academic disciplines, and many of them are peer-reviewed. Most of them are in PDF format to be read online or downloaded and saved. Notice also the um, Creative Commons emblem. 
It should also be noted here that many commercial and academic presses have made their out-of-print books openly available. For example, the Ohio State University Press Open Collection includes over 200 titles um, in a wide variety of um, academic disciplines, which are available in PDF format and may be read, downloaded, or assigned as required reading for classes. Now it's time to talk about Creative Commons. We've already seen several web collections displaying the Creative Commons licensing emblem. CC is a registration protocol that one can use to identify a work as copyright protected, but still inform potential users that they need not ask permission to use or to reproduce it. An author sim wishing to register a work simply clicks the Share Your Work button and then goes through a series of dialog boxes that inform the system what um, a, a user has permission to do. Authors may choose among six different licensing conditions. Another important partnership is SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. SPARC has over 200 members, and it describes itself as a global coalition committed to making open the default for research and education. One important function of SPARC is to serve as a lobbying group for the interests of the OER community. As such, it tracks and analyzes OER-relevant regula regulations and legislation. The Spark website is also a clearinghouse for news items about OER events worldwide, and also for descriptions of the OER plans and policies of its member institutions. The OER movement is one of the more exciting and encouraging developments in higher education today. It's dedicated to the propositions that that all citizens have the right to equal education opportunities and that an informed citizenry is vital to the maintenance of free and democratic institutions. If we truly believe that the goals of higher education are better met by collaboration and cooperation than by competition for profits, we must begin by making open access the paradigm for education at all levels. Thank you very much for your attention.